So uh, briefly, uh, I'm going to introduce the, some, our company, Salagis, um, in terms of what we do, what kind of company we are. And then uh, I'll be talking about the analytics uh, and the data that we work with. And then later, uh, Martin will go a bit more into how we deploy our tools and uh, how we actually work with our cloud uh, ecosystem. Okay, so um, Solages, we actually were, uh, well, the tagline is that we are data and software solution architects for solar investments. I think that wraps it up quite nicely. Um, and we work with data and software for um, basically all the steps in solar investment process. We've got actually over 1,000 uh, customers all over the world, almost all countries, in fact. Um, and we complete over 5,000 projects per year. Uh, our founder is actually Slovak, and they uh, have over 20 years of experience in this industry and started out as uh, academic researchers and then uh, later on implemented their solutions into software. Um, so very briefly, in terms of the um, process and our products that cover the, the PV process. So um, at the beginning, uh, if you are trying to set up a power plant or even your own um, small system, uh, you can use our Prospect app, actually, which is at our booth. And um, what that does is actually allows you to uh, drop a pin on the world map and find out a, about a lot of different in, in interesting metrics uh, that you can use to decide whether that's a good site. So you can really quickly drop a few pint pins and uh, find out uh, which ones are good and which ones are not so good. And then Evaluate, which is our second kind of service, um, enables you to basically go a bit deeper with a selected site, and we actually provide uh, full time series and um, uh, TMY data, so that's something that we can explain to you later, but um, don't worry about that. But at this tip, you can actually um, figure out what is your optimal power plant configuration, you know, how you want to tilt your panels, uh, how you want to set them up, things like that. Um, the monitor actually is something that uh, allows you to track your performance and benchmark it, um, whether you have a small measuring station set up or an existing power plant. And lastly, uh, forecast is uh, self-explanatory. We have a forecasting team that can provide very short forecasts in terms of like the next few hours, but also uh, the next few days and so on. So that's uh, a little bit about the company. Oh, and the. Uh, in the corner here, you can see Solaris Analyst, which is part of the monitor. So that is the software that I uh, personally work with. And we've got a few people here on the booth that work with this uh, software. So that's part of the monitor suit. And uh, I'll be mentioning it a bit more later. So generally, we work with the following types of data. So uh, firstly, the Earth observation data. So you know, this is satellite data which are global and um, cover the whole Earth, typically. Um, then uh, we actually work with data uh, that we call ground measurements, uh, which can be solar and meteorological parameters collected by um, such uh, instruments, as you can see on the middle image. Um, and then lastly, we work with uh, PV energy outputs, so photovoltaic output and data from power plants. Um, and we produce different kinds of simulations and forecasts and so on. Um, Okay, so we're going to go a bit deeper into the ground measurement data. So that's the stuff that we focus on in the analyst team. Um, so um, the typical data set is a time series data. Um, as I mentioned, that's collected by these different instruments. Um, so what you're seeing here are um, on x-axis you've got dates. And every day, uh, you've got a few quantities that we measure. So these are different types of irradiance. Uh, so basically, the amount of light you're getting. Um, so the, the bottom two are basically direct and diffuse. So something that um, you have more of. So it's direct is something that you have more of if you don't have clouds. Diffuse is the opposite. If you have cloudy days, you are getting more diffuse light. Um, and then GHI, the top one, uh, basically combines these two to give you like an overall metric. So as you can see, um, some of these nice uh, bell curves or, or well, some of the, those n nicely defined ones um, could be considered nice days, whereas the one on the left is like a very cloudy, um, yeah, messy day. Um, so where does it come from? I mentioned the, uh, it comes from ground um, instruments like this, which you need to set up and obviously pay for, and, uh, et cetera. So I'll talk a bit about that later. But the question is, why do people need it? 
And actually, um, so there's two points. So firstly, it's, called, uh, it's what's called bankable data. So if this data is actually verified uh, and quality control, you can literally take it to a bank and get a loan for your PV project and you'll get finance, hopefully. Um, and then we also use it for other things, for example, site adaptation. So this is a process where we uh, take a um, data point like this and actually adjust our global model um, to be better using a single site like this. Um, we actually use pretty standard uh, Python uh, libraries to actually deal with this data. So NumPy Pandas Matplotlib um, for statistical stuff. We use scikit-learn or stats models, but obviously we um, use other packages in, in some smaller projects, etc. Um, okay, so uh, just to give you a brief overview of why ground measurements versus satellite model data. So, um, yes, ground measurement data, as you can imagine, you set up a site and you can have really high accuracy. Um, so that's why people want to uh, use it. And it can go into pretty small time granularity, down to seconds or singles of minutes. Whereas satellite models, uh, you still have pretty good accuracy, but you usually have a, like a mesh or like a raster and you're tracking it every you know, 15 minutes and sometimes hourly. Um, but however, the ground measurements data have a lot of other, uh, I would say, costs or potential downsides. You, so you obviously need to set up, you need to pay for the instruments, you need to operate them, maintain them, uh, and you might still end up with uh, some gaps in data. Uh, you need to do your own quality control. So all of these things uh, that are a bit expensive to manage, actually, um, which you don't get with satellite models. So that's why we actually um, look at these issues in our software. So I'll just briefly mention a few of the issues or the major ones, and then I'll actually go through a couple of um, algorithms that we use um, or tools that we developed that, uh, to tackle these. So obviously we've got some basic data quality issues very often um, because the, the instruments are still operated by humans. Um, so you might have things like uh, data dropping out, so missing values. You might have uh, values that are below or above uh, physical, um, maxima, minima. You can have some artificially oscillating values. So all these kind of unnatural things we're trying to detect. Um, you can have a time reference shift, <clears throat> which is a, quite a big deal, but I'll get a bit more into it later. But uh, this can be caused either by simply having a different time zone, but also by some more um, like complicated things. Um, shading is a big deal in terms of um, you actually deciding where to build a power plant because obviously you don't want uh, the light to be obstructed by objects in the horizon, so that uh, we have a tool for detecting that as well. Uh, Dew and frost can really shuffle things up because it creates these funky shapes in our time series. So we also try to detect that if possible. We also have things like signal deg degradation, which usually occurs if you're not cleaning your instruments properly and your signal basically starts to degrade. Um, instrument misalignment and others. Um, so there's, there's quite a lot of issues. We are in process or we have built tools for most of these actually. Um, some are performing better, some are worse, but we're still working on uh, integrating these fully into our software. Um, so I'll go over a couple of them, as I mentioned. So the time reference control one is uh, really key for us because um, the location and time uh, in UTC basically determines the exact solar posi position. Um, so we really need to get this right, uh, otherwise we can't really do any more data processing with these data sets, um, which, which we can detect the shifts in. So, as I mentioned, this can be uh, as simple as a time zone shift, um, but perhaps can be uh, daylight savings time. There's a lot of random shifts and drifts that you might get from, uh, let's say, the loggers on the instruments, um, and also how you define your timestamp uh, in your measurement interval. You can place the timestamp at the beginning of the interval center or on the right side, so at the end. So. This is an example of how, how it can look like. Um, basically, your whole time series shifted compared to the reference, which here is the, the well, the dotted line, the blue line is like the corrected uh, data. 
Um, so this is how uh, we actually determine uh, when we have shifts in our data set. So if you actually look at this uh, top left plot, um, so we look at the clearness index on the y-axis, which is uh, basically like a ratio between the, the light you're actually getting versus what you could be getting. So basically a ratio that tells you how nice of a day uh, you have or, or like a time uh, point you have, data point. So um, basically one should be your maximum value. On the x-axis, uh, you're looking at sun elevation. So what this does is basically um, it uses the fact that uh, the sun elevation removes the, the mirror symmetry that you have uh, in sun position during the day. So this way we can separate morning and afternoon and actually get this messy pattern. But because we're getting so many values above one, we know something's wrong. So in ideal case or after we apply our methods, it should look something like this, uh, where uh, the two mor you know, morning and after afternoon are generally aligned, aligned and you're not getting any values above one, except for maybe some outliers here. Um, so th that's basically the, the conceptual uh, point behind it, but we actually use uh, something called change point detection, um, which uses algorithms like PELT. We can talk about that at the booth if you want, but um, yeah, that's some fancy statistical tool that actually can detect multiple change points in the data set. So we can actually have multiple different periods with different uh, shifts and drifts detected. And we can even return an uncertainty bound for these periods. So if, as you can see in this uh, particular data set, we found a shift of 120 minutes um, all the way through, but in some regions we are more or less certain about that prediction. Um, uh, obviously it's, it comes with some limitations. So uh, if you have wrong coordinates, that is a big deal. Um, you need to make sure that you actually enter your right coordinates. Um, then if you have a mix of different issues um, combined together, that makes it very difficult, obviously, to detect anything. And then if you have short shifts during the day, that also makes it quite difficult for our algorithm. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about the shading detection. So this is actually something you can try at our booth uh, in our software as well. Um, and it, it's quite a funny exercise or interesting exercise because we look at this plot uh, on the top, well, sorry, bottom right. And we actually look at the sun azimuth and elevation throughout the whole year. So what you're seeing here is the whole data set, um, which can be one or more years long. Um, and it's mapped on this uh, plane by projecting day by day uh, the data points. So actually one day creates like a line that goes from the left um, and circles over to the right. Um, so azimuth 180 would be south. So uh, this is actually a, sta a station in uh, SAV, so the Slovak Academy of Sciences that we have set up. And by doing this and measuring the amount, amount of light you're getting, you actually get this nice um, image of the horizon. And you can spot uh, where your objects and horizon are obscuring your um, light source. Um, so. Yeah, you can actually try this. This is part of our competition, actually, at the booth. So you can get involved and, and win some prizes. But we'll mention that later as well. So um, the way we actually formalize this into uh, an automatic tool, we uh, use uh, an algorithm called kernel density estimation to connect these blobs that we detect and uh, flag our data set. Um, so again, this has some lim limitations. And that's especially if you're using uh, well, not if you're using, if you uh, have some temporary shading, so if you have some objects which are there for a um, short amount of time, um, and then maybe next year you don't have that object in there, then in this tool you would basically get that um, shadowy shape overwritten by, by the nicer year. And same thing goes for half-transparent objects. If you have things like uh, trees which are not very thick or something like that, that can be quite difficult. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, we actually have a tool for almost every issue that I mentioned on that list, and we actually collect connected into our uh, pipeline. Um, and we designed this to be quite modular so that we can switch things on and off, add things as required. Um, 
And that enables us to actually run all of them together in an automated way, but also to do things like batch analysis and model evaluation and more, more uh, complex analytics um, for ourselves. Um, and that also makes it uh, deployable as a whole in other Solaris projects as well. So um, the way we actually deploy it uh, or work with it, we actually wrap it up in a classic pip package uh, and actually version it and manage it in a Nexus repository. Um, and then we also, so we use it in our analyst desktop application, which I mentioned a few times, um, but uh, we are also on our way to integrating it into our cloud ecosystem. Uh, yes, we use CICD pipelines to um, deploy our app and build it, test it uh, on all the major operating systems. Um, and yeah, so that's pretty much about it uh, from my side. And I think Martin will now tell you a bit more about how we integrate this and other things into our cloud. Yes. So hello, I'm Martin Michal from Solargis and I'm helping teams like Oliver's team and other Clever team to integrate it into one Solaris Next platform. Uh, it should be fully deployed on cloud. We are in the half of the way, I would say. And so let's start why we are deploying into the cloud, actually. So let's talk about some motivation. So this is just super simple example how our uh, computation graph could like, and that's just like really partial of that. Uh, as already Oliver mentioned, we, we are having like satellite image data. We have satellite processing data, we have customer data, we have a lot of algorithms which are processing them, which are adjusting them and uh, doing some ETL stuff, and it's really hard to manage. So this is just like really simply example from our evaluate application, how complex our workflows are and uh, why it's probably the best way to do it in some microservice way, right? Uh, as I said, we are only in the halfway, I would say, from migration into the cloud. So we still have two data centers in Bratislava, uh, uh, altogether over 100 physical machines. Uh, we are also in, in the process of uh, building of Kubernetes cluster. So it's still not really in production, but we are on the way with that. But the problem with, I mean, many of you probably work in some on-premise uh, infrastructure and it's not really like easy to work with that. You really need some whole department to scale that, to maintain that. And I just figure out some uh, some challenges here. Uh, I can just mention some of them, you know, like deployment into on-premise is not that easy it, as in the cloud. I mean, if you have Kubernetes, yeah, maybe that's kind of solution, so we'll see. But there, are, you, you need to think really about every details. Like I can just mention energy parallelability, you know, like, okay, you can rent like your diesel generator in your data center, but is it, is, like, is it sure it will work? Because we had experience that it could not, not work. Uh, internet reliability, administration, updates of the uh, update of the machine, and so on. I mean, it's really not the not the thing you want to resolve. You want to resolve your business problem. In our case, uh, algorithms and data, as Oliver mentioned. Uh, so basically, I, I, I created just some slides uh, from a bit helicopter view, so not really only about the, what the Oliver mentioned, but uh, generally like 10 pillars of things I wish I knew before I started like migration to the clouds, so different kind of projects, because uh, it, 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 it's consistent of many roles, basically. So first rule, and like four years ago when I started like uh, migrate myself from like data science guy to some kind of cloud guy, you know, I thought, okay, let's go to AWS. I will just start some EC2. That's like virtual machine on the EC, uh, on the AWS environment. And I just, you know, set up some cron jobs. We actually were solving some kind of SMED benchmarking in the previous company. And I was happy, yeah, I am cloud developer, right? So after a while, uh, we had more and more platform for benchmarking, more and more resources and so on. And I, I end up with uh, 500 gigabytes of RAM, right, of EC2. And it was like super expensive thousands of dollars, and uh, I'm not talking about problems with maintenance, operation, uh, deployment, and so on. So really, migration to the clouds is, is kind of shift of thinking how you design your solution. Not only like take your solution you would have an on-premise or even locally and put it into cloud, uh, some virtual machine, no, it's not. It's like you should really invest in your, ta your time and uh, change some parad paradigm how you, how you actually develop those solutions. 
Uh, second pillar is uh, actually not really like only cloud related, it's like really good practice related for Python and that's for example how Oliver and his team deliver his code uh, for us as a, as a cloud integrator. So we are basically using Nexus repository and we are pushing uh, into that repository the code they are, they are making as, as a normal Python library. So you don't really care if it's pandas, numpy, or autocure measurement, how they call their library, or any other model-based library from our company. For, for me, as a cloud integrator, I don't really care, because we are using this kind of repository. I can install those library. They are versioned properly, so like I know 1.5 I can use in uh, dev, 1.5 I can, 1.6 I can use on different environment and I can manage it as you manage pandas or any other uh, scientific library available on the market. And this is, this is just super quick example how thin could be then cloud layer on, on your, for example, Lambda. Really, you can just import uh, uh, your library from your, from your colleagues, uh, where it's like, it, it's already pretty fine and you know it's working because they have their test, they have their CI CD and really in two lines, which I, if I will super over, oversimplify it, I can, I can make AI or analytics which Oliver mentioned. So this is how you can like, you know, separate a layer of complexity between the teams. So then uh, integration team can really just be user of the library. Another stuff, super important I would say, uh, I mean, anybody of us is overdefined with, you know, different kind of uh, uh, version of libraries, even with pandas, you know, they change their uh, interface, they're changing even sometimes the functionality in some edge cases, uh, uh, functions, and so on. So really, like, you really need to dockerize your data science code, data science jobs, because other, without that, you will, you will be lost. And uh, plus, it's really helpful for deployment into AWS environment. So basically this is flow we are doing with our uh, data science job on the cloud. So we, we, we make container, we put it into Elastic Container Registry and then based on how long it takes, you could put it into AWS Lambda or AWS Fargate. So those two services are basically ready for you to use and they are serverless. I will talk about that later. Maybe this could looks like, okay, it's pretty complicated, right? So who will do it? But actually, uh, AWS provides CDK and it's, it also support Python language. So he, this, it could be actually, if you would be not really good developer, you can put it into one line. This one line of code is doing all of this, all of this uh, flow for you, you know, for, for free basically. So CDK you, uh, is like infrastructure as a code tool where you can deploy your stack into AWS. And this is an example, I, I actually also, also select the sub part of the code and you can see which card is uh, uh, responsible for building and pushing Docker into ECR, which, which, code, which part of the code is responsible for setting up your uh, Lambda settings, for example, memory size, timeout, environment variables, or some other advanced uh, functionality. And altogether, it's putting into functional Docker Lambda, which could be up to 10 gigabytes uh, big, and it's just ready for you. So basically, this is how you can deploy your first Docker 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 based data science uh, application into the cloud via infrastructure as a code. And important stuff, I really, I mean, probably for most of you it's clear, but for me, four or five years ago, it wasn't. You should really start your uh, deployment from first second. Uh, we are CI/CD and with support for multiple environments. A again, CDK is a great tool. You can super easily uh, deploy like four, or five, even hundreds uh, environments, and then you can operate them like separately. You can, you know, use on demo or in the production different environments, and uh, use for the, the uh, even for feature branches. You can use your own uh, your own uh, environment. So really think about that and use CDK for that. And bonus for us as a Python guy, everything is in Python. So you don't need to, you know, read super long Terraform uh, stuff. It's just normal Python where you can use uh, for, for loops, if, if statements, dictionaries, whatsoever, which is really natural for us in comparison with Terraform. 
which is for maybe especially if you are transferring yourself from data science, is not really what you really want to do, want to work for, work with. So uh, I mentioned EC2 and like just migrate your server or scripts or cron jobs. It's not really how you should do your cloud migration in 2022. And how you should really do it is like using serverless. And here is just a quick example why actually Amazon built the AWS, you know, or one of the reasons. Uh, if, you, if you would have it, everything on EC2 or other machine, you would need to have amount of servers which could handle Black Friday. So here on the, on the chart you can see a uh, number of requests on AWS and, or, or other services, I'm not sure, uh, during Black Friday. So it's six times more than usual traffic. So what, what would be the solution? You know, do you want to buy six times more uh, servers you need just for one day in, in the year, you know, like, or one week in the year? In our example of Solaris, we, we wouldn't have like 100 servers, you know, but uh, 600 servers, and that's pretty expensive. So we really don't want to do it, and that's why they create, or that's why they're an existing serverless approach, and how, how does it work for, for those who didn't hear about that? You design, implement solution, let's say, for example, those Dockerize uh, data sign job. Uh, in testing, first, you are, you, are, you are running it on only on one server, you know, somewhere in the AWS and so on. After a while, it's in production or in dev, you, it's starting to be used more and more, and in the end, you can end up with like millions invocations per month, right? And, but you don't care. You just implement your solution, you design your solution, and you really don't care about this stuff. So you don't need to go to uh, your department, uh, which, are, which are handling data center, and it's it just working, you know? Okay, there are some limitations, like a uh, number of invocation uh, in, in, in one time and so on, but uh, everything is customizable. Uh, and serverless is not only about scalability, that's like me. I, I would say serverless is also, as I already mentioned, the, the way how you should really operate because you can really concentrate on your business logic, on, on the resolving the, the really cool stuff as Oliver mentioned. You know, that's, that's the stuff you really want to, to resolve and not like uh, how many servers you should have, what kind of version of Ubuntu you have. You know? uh, those kind of departments could be huge, expensive, and it's not really solving the business problem you want to solve. So with this framework, if you have really serverless Dockerize application, you really, your decrease are concern over infrastructure and really f you can focus on your business logic. So that's it. And uh, serverless is not about only computation because right now, or I mean, till now I, I was talking only about AWS Lambda or Fargate for computation, but AWS uh, is providing a huge number of serverless, so ready for you without any headache, uh, how to run it, maintain it. Uh, from messaging, you know, uh, through security, logging, uh, databases, uh, analytics, uh, bucketing, and so on, uh, monitoring. I mean, basically any, any part of your application, which you usually need, it's 99% is already ready for you on the AWS server solution. So really invest your time if you will, uh, if you will, if you will something deploy into AWS, maybe there is something for you. I mean, really there is big chance. And this is also important stuff. Uh, we, we had also in Solargis quite a discussion, let's, for example, what kind of queue messaging we should use. There, there were some group which were like, okay, let's go for RabbitMQ. We will deploy it on our uh, servers and so on and so on, and after a while it will be there. I mean, why, why we should do it, you know, like AWS has their service, for example, SQS, SNS for queuing, and you, you would be amazed how great is integrate, integratable with any other AWS service. So, for example, you want to invoke automatic Lambda, no problem. You want to uh, scale it up, no problem. You want to, you know, ha as a part uh, of CDK infrastructure SQL, no problem. So, uh, don't really go even into this discussion. If there is AWS solution which is good enough for you, start with that, and I'm quite sure you will, you, you will not be sad about this. Uh, uh, decision and this is just one example we are using uh, exactly in Oliver case uh, for quality control which we are computing on AWS we are using uh, for orchestration step function um, again maybe airflow could have a bit more functions actually I, I, I can't compare those two because I didn't work with airflow too much 
but why we should use Airflow where we could use step function where you can really easy integrate, you know, like some kind of flow where one step in the, in the graph could be Docker Lambda, one could be simple Lambda, one could be Fargate, and what, one could be service to send uh, a message into queue, you know, and uh, you don't need to have it in one monoid application. You can, you know, separate them and you can join them uh, like you can see on the screen. And as, of course, everything you can deploy via CDK and uh, logs for everything are already included, and basically you will love it. So that's it. This is just example how, what kind of different service you can use in uh, step function. So a uh, really nice tool. And the same thing for monitoring. I mean, there is like a huge number of the, of the monitoring, dashboarding, alarming uh, application, like Datadog, Grafana, whatsoever. Uh, but again, if you are already in AWS native service uh, organization and all of your stack you are trying to deploy via AWS, all metrics you need are really already ready for you. You know, like number of failed invocation of Lambda, it's there. Number of uh, item, items in DynamoDB or any other da database, it's already there. So you can just need to create your logic, what do you want to monitor, and you don't need to build new solutions. So we, again, you can save, save like weeks or months of work, you know, with integrating into, let's say, Datadog or I don't know, whatever. Uh, this is deep topic. I would not go really into that because we can talk about that uh, for for hours, but uh, I still have feeling that many, uh, many projects, uh, in especially in data sense, are starting, okay, let's make, uh, uh, let's create some uh, table in MySQL, PostgreSQL, put their data and so on, and we we will have it as a, our base for our data science. I mean, really, especially in data science, but also in any other data engineering uh, solution, you should really consider use data lake and not data warehousing approach. Uh, it has many advantages, also a few disadvantages, so that's why sometimes people are uh, building data lake and data warehouse solution. But uh, in data science, I mean, it's, it's, it's like super clear uh, way because you can not only have your you know, table data, you can have also, you know, any, uh, any images data, which are great for some kind of image processing, or you could have even raster data, you know, that's what we are using in SolarGIS for covering the whole world. So uh, really think about that. Uh, for those who have never heard about data lake, basically uh, in AWS, you have, uh, you have a bucket system or, you know, storage system S3, uh, what is basically S3 centric system, and uh, you just put their data. You you put it there into let's say some fashion format as a parquet, and then it's really you can use it f uh, from bench of application which are which are ready for use. Jack's example, just in our example, we are putting this as a parquet th those customer data. Uh, then we can do some ETL, and uh, they are basically ready to explore via Athena. That's basically SQL-like experience, but there is no database behind it. And then you can super easily visualize those data via QuickSight. So again, everything is ready for you. After a while, maybe you will realize it's not enough, but the re really, in, especially in the first iteration of the projects, feel free to use those. So that's one point. Uh, again, one experience we had in SolarGIS, but also I remember back in the days in Piano, we were trying to connect our air code, you know, we had the huge data science department and we were doing great our uh, code based uh, data science solution, but after a while, okay, how are we going to integrate it? Now, in the, in the, in the SolarGIS, we are basically solving it on quarterly basis. So this is example, how we can do it. Uh, the AWS provides great SNS SQS queue solution. Uh, I mean, most of you already heard about the queue, you know, as a, uh, data type, but this is a really high scalable solution, which can again deploy, which can be again deployable via CDK. And this is just example of our TMY project, uh, where all uh, backend on web is in TypeScript. And uh, our, our, basically the core job is on, uh, on premise. And that's why, because uh, we need to process over terabytes of data there. That's what we store on our uh, on premise architecture and this is how you can actually join it you know like you you just deploy some kind of workers in your in your core servers and they are just listening to the queues 
you can even prioritize them, and so on. So really, if you are building any hybrid solution, so hybrid could be multi-language or cloud versus on-premise, uh, just use SQS because it's easy. You know? So again, if we, would build, if we would use some kind of RabbitMQ or something, we would need to, again, deploy it, maintain more environments, and so on. So really not a good way to go. And I have one last point, and that's uh, not sure if I, I will be able to describe it properly right now, but th this is example from, again, from this uh, customer, uh, customer data processing. So may know this, we sh you should really try to learn all kind of AWS service and their, their nuances, because you can design your solution and architect, of, architect your solution, things of that easily. So let's just uh, simplify it. So we have this kind of DynamoDB table, which are a kind of meta catalog for our data sets. We have three data sets, raw data, standardize them, and then we apply uh, quality control, which Oliver described. So in each state, we need to change. Uh, uh, after successfully uh, computation, we need to change state from processing to finish. That's easy. You can just do it via some, as, as I said, Docker-based Docker Lambda or Docker uh, Data Science uh, Docker-based Fargate. So, Probably that would also you do with your monoid application or your on-premise application or whatsoever. Uh, where is the problem? Uh, as I said, this is like computation computation grab which we defined. After updating the first uh, data set in your meta catalog, you want to find all children childrens and change their state into processing. I mean, with some old-fashioned approach, I don't know cron job or something. It would be really not easy because you need to have some trigger or, or some uh, reactive system, but in AWS, uh, DynamoDB is providing DynamoDB stream, and it's basically invoke your Lambda with any change in your DynamoDB uh, table. So basically, you, you get your, your old state or your new state. And you can have super simple DynamoDB Lambda, I mean DynamoDB stream Lambda, we just checking all your child, children's and change them state to processing. And third uh, business requirements, well, after three months, we need to remove that, that kind of data because we have some regulatory, regulatory uh, requirements. Again, in old-fashioned technology, you would need probably some cron job who would run every day to check when you, uh, when you add those kind of data into DynamoDB, DynamoDB and then remove it. I mean, here in DynamoDB, you can just put time to leave attributes and after three weeks or three months, I have typo actually here, you can, you can just, it, it will just remove automatically. So you don't need to, you don't need to, you know, care about anything. It will just do it themselves, you know, for free basically. So you don't need to support any cron job, any, anything. It will, it will be just removed for itself. So that's just my point. So really invest your time when you are, are when you are basically arch making architecture of any solution because those features like time to leave or DynamoDB stream, and there's like hundreds of them in AWS, could really simplify your solution. Uh, so uh, that's basically it, my 10 pillars of what I would like to know before I started to migrate into uh, cloud. So this is just like quick slide that we have competition. Uh, you can, you can uh, actually, on our boot, you can actually win uh, the solar what is this gadget? Solar gadget. Portable solar panel. So portable solar panel. So free feel free to join us. We have also some some goodies as energy drink and so on. Actually, it's a tonic drink, and yeah, hiring. I mean, uh, we are growing as a whole solar industry, so we really need some talents. Uh, feel free to check our job offerings on Solargis.com or other you know job offering portals. But if you really like what we are doing and we can, you can talk about that on Solaris Boot, uh, we can always you know, create a role for you because we are resolving many challenges on cloud, on data science, in software engineering, so feel free to contact us or talk with us today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now we have a bunch of questions. Do I need to be a scientist to work on some project or with the data? Where to start? So that's actually a series of questions. So do I need to be a scientist? Where do I start? 
And then another uh, any. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to pronounce that. So depends Anywhere what where you messed up at your work. So, um, <laughs> okay. I guess it depends what kind of project you, you're talking about. If you're talking about a PV project that you want to set up your solar panels at home, you can, for instance, use our software um, that's available as a web app. But if you want to play with the data, uh, there are some uh, publicly available sites. So, you know, some of these instruments that I showed you on pictures, there are some meteorological stations that actually uh, make them available publicly so you can play with it uh, if you want. Um, off the top, top of my head, I can't remember names, but you can talk to us at the booth and we can give you some. Um, okay, the any next one? Yeah. Can we go ahead? Uh, how do you watch and reduce AWS costs? Yeah, so regarding watching and monitoring, as I said, AWS provide great monitoring tools for that, even for billings. So that's one part. And of course, it's important to design your solution to keep in mind, you know, the cost. That's like, of course, you are taking some kind of decision what you should do. And uh, a big, in, big advantage for Solaris is we are B2B. Our product is kind of expensive. So, uh, you know, data we are providing are not like 99 cents data. So we have great advantage with that that we can afford you know to move workload into cloud because you know if if the number of requests will uh, increase our re also our re revenue will increase like heavily so it's just uh, fair enough for us to to compute it on the cloud do you plan to move 100 percent of your workload to the cloud or do you plan to operate in a hybrid mode? Yeah, one of the biggest advantage of Solargis is we have uh, over 27 years of data from the satellites. So you can imagine those are raster data every 15 minutes for the whole world. So that's a huge number of data, especially in this Evaluate project where, where we are operating them. So that's why I also mentioned a hybrid solution. So in ne very, very next few years, we will not fully migrate. We, we will support in some application uh, hi hybrid regime because of this kind of uh, volume of data. So you can imagine uh, our petabase data to store in S3 and process them, it's not really cheap. What are your thoughts on vendor lock-in? Yeah, <laughs> uh, we, are, we are there basically, but you know, like AWS is like, I mean, 60% of workload right now is working, uh, working on AWS. Of, I mean, of all companies. So, I, 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 I mean, that's basically a solution. I mean, we are hearing from owners and so on, we should really not do it, but how it's, it's really hard to not do it, you know, when you are trying to integrate yourself into AWS, especially those serverless things, you can just, you know, have it in the mind. What we are doing is, for example, your, when, when you are building your Docker uh, stuff, or for example, your old uh, data science jobs in Docker, that's pretty easy to migrate into Google Cloud or even on-premise infrastructure. So that's one mechanism we are using, but of course, we are there. So hopefully we'll, it will be okay. What about cloud outages? Are, uh, do you have some backup running on-premise or a different cloud provider? Uh, no, I mean, mm, if AWS is down, there is 60% of, I mean, uh, internet is down, so basically it should be okay. I do not, like, I, I mean, in last months we didn't have any outages, and we have few outages on our premise, so I would, I would say this is still a uh, better ratio on, on the AWS. So, no, we don't have any second cloud. Maybe when we will be in the phase that we, we will have, like, some kind of 99.90% uh, uh, availability, we would need to think about it, but uh, right now we are happy what we have. So that basically means AWS is too big to fail, so we need to, you know, if it's down, everybody's down, so who cares? <laughs> there we go. And uh, the thing is, uh, our ingestion from satellites, that's our core business is still on-premise, so it will not affect our core data processing, it will, it will affect just temporary providing of data for customers, and they could probably wait those 15 minutes, hopefully. So in your case, Lambda plus Fargate totally replaced EC, EC2 for computing, or uh, is there EC2 still in place for some use cases? 
I mean, basically, Fargate is just virtualization of EC2. So in the behind the scene, Fargate is uh, starting on EC2, and then after f finishing the job, is basically turning it off. So actually, Fargate is hidden EC2, but you don't need to think about things you need to think in EC2 using. So basically, yeah, with Fargate, you, you can work without any EC2. Do you use CloudWatch for logs or some kind of interceptor? It's, it's a pretty expensive service. We are using CloudWatch, and from my experience, it doesn't look like super expensive. As, uh, again, we are in niche business, so our data are not 90 cents, 99 cents data, so maybe that's why we are like, we, we don't have that problem to invest a few hundreds of bucks into monitoring. But maybe for others, our other business, it's too much. I don't know. Your Soro Atlas looks really cool. Are you also validating your PV genera generation predictions with long-term data measurements from deployed PV plants? Yes, yeah, so actually we, we have quite a few validation sites. So these are, uh, I mean, most of the public ones, for example, uh, that um, we actually have a team of operators who also use our software, but also validate it by hand. And then we use the process that I mentioned called site ad adaptation to calibrate our global models um, with these sites. That was our last question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mikrobit je programovateľný milý počítač, ktorý ti dovolí prepojiť informatiku s kreativitou. Dá sa programovať veľmi jednoducho a ovládať tak, aby robil presne to, čo chceš. O pár minút sme zvládli rozsvietiť vlastný obrázok na displeji a o chvíľu sme už obrázky diálkovo prepínali druhým mikrobitom. Mikrobit má v sebe aj super vychytávky, ako sú tlačidlá, senzor pohybu, kompas a teplomé. K mikrobitu ale môžeš pripojiť množstvo ďalších vecí. Tu programujeme, aká animácia sa nám má ukázať na LED pásiku. Ja som na ňom naprogramovala dúhu. Teraz programujeme podľa nôd kohútika Jarabeho. Najlepšie na mikrobite je, že si viem vytvoriť napríklad blikajúceho robota alebo gitaru, ktorú ovládam tak, že ňou zatraciem, alebo futbalovú bránku, kde mi mikrobit počíta, koľko gólov som dala, alebo kúlové svietiace topánky a tisíc ďalších vecí, ktoré ešte len vymyslím. Mikrobit je hračka, ktorú schováš do dlane a vytvoríš z nej čokoľvek. Tak čo s ňou spravíš ty? Každých 60 sekúnd si 28 tisíc ľudí predplatí službu Netflix. Odošle sa 197 miliónov e-mailov, stiahne sa 414 tisíc aplikácií a ukradne niekoľko tisíc hesiel. Na internete sa toho deje veľa. A všetko najdôležitejšie sa dozviete na Živé SK. Živé SK. Technológie ľudskou rečou.